And then, of course, I have to welcome the campus principal of the Kwakwa campus, Dr. Martin Mandiu, who is sitting right in front. Welcome, Martin. Uh, then I'd also like to welcome the Kwakwa campus vice principal for academic and research, Professor Paul Satoli. I saw her earlier. There she is, right in front. Welcome, Paul. And of course, the Kwakwa vice, camp, vice campus, uh, campus vice principal, sorry, support services, support services, Mr. Tabor Manshu. Welcome, Tabor. Uh, then the executive director for student affairs, Mr. Temba Tlasu, is here. I also saw him earlier. He, there he is sitting next to Martin. Temba, welcome. The Dean of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, Professor Dani Vermeulen, is also joining us virtually. Um, and then I'd like to welcome the Assistant Dean, Economic and Management Sciences, Dr. Calvin Mutsingiri. I saw him earlier. Calvin, welcome. Uh, and then, of course, the Assistant Dean Education, Dr. Sias Tsutsetsi, I also saw earlier. He's also in the front. Welcome, Sias. Uh, the Assistant Dean of the Faculty of the Humanities, Dr. Jared McDonald. There's someone knocking on the door. Let <laughs> <laughs> me just open the door quickly. Uh, you have to walk around, sorry. <laughs> Maybe that's Jared. <laughs> I didn't see Jared. I don't think he's here. I haven't seen him. So maybe he's the guy knocking on the door. Okay, so in, in Jared's absence, welcome, Jared. Uh, then I'd like to make a special uh, word of welcome to the Assistant Dean, Natural and Agricultural Sciences, Professor Aliza Leroux who will have the honorable job of uh, introducing uh, Professor McQuarrer uh, as soon as I've gone through this extensive list. Uh, then uh, the Senior Director Institutional Advancement, Dr. Russell Alley, is also virtual. Then a very special word of welcome to the Head of the Department of Geography, Professor Sam Adelabu, um, and Sam will do the, the, the thank yous at the end of Jeffrey's talk. Then the head of the Afromontane Research Unit, Dr. Rolf Clark, is also sitting in front. Rolf, welcome to you. And then, of course, the most important person of this evening, to Professor Jeffrey McQuarrer. Welcome, sir. It is an honor to be here and celebrate your inaugural lecture, and I'm looking forward to what you're going to say. Uh, Professor McQuarrer has informed me that his family is joining online, so his wife, Esther, his daughter, Leslie, uh, and his son, Jeffrey, uh, as well as his uh, nephew, Ignatius Baikwa, is also joining virtually. So to his family mem members, uh, we do miss that you're not here, um, and I hope that you will enjoy, enjoy this with us. Then to all the academic staff members who are here, who I didn't mention specifically, thank you for coming. It's really fantastic to have you here. Uh, all the students, postgraduate and undergraduates, thank you for supporting Jeffrey. Um, and you must be so proud to have an inaugural lecture here on our, our Kwakwa campus. Uh, for all the visitors, uh, welcome. And without further ado, I then ask uh, Professor LaRue to introduce Professor McGuada. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues and students and friends. It, I am extremely proud and happy to be able to do this introduction. Um, <clears throat> and uh, here goes. Welcome, Jeffrey. Jeffrey McQuarrer <laughs> has 25 years of experience as a university lecturer and researcher. He joined the UFS in 2010 as lecturer in environmental geography. His research interests include natural resource conservation and management, climate change, and rural livelihoods. Professor McQuarrer has published more than 50 papers in international peer-reviewed journals, presented 27 papers at national and international conferences. He has graduated eight masters and 11 PhD students. <laughs> He is a C2 NRF rated researcher. He is the coordinator of the university staff doctoral program, which involves collaboration between the UFS, the University of Venda, the Appalachian State University, the University of Colorado, and the University of Montana, as well as coordinator of the Mountain to Mountain Research Project, a collaborative research project between the UFS and the Appalachian State University. 
He is a faculty affiliate of the Department of Geography and the W.A. Franca College of Forestry and Conservation at the University of Montana. And colleagues, you, you have heard me sighing. It is because it's just so obvious to me how overqualified Professor Mukwara is for this position. I am very proud to introduce you to Professor Jeffrey Mukwara. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A while ago, I was asked the question, are you ready? And I said, you will find out soon. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you look at the first part of the title of my presentation this evening, The Last Days of Plenty, you see I'm using it as a metaphor or euphemism and I'm using it figuratively to imply the impending losses of environmental resources in the mountain as a result of climate change. I've been engaged with uh, climate change research for a while now, because it is an interesting subject to me. And one aspect of it, which has captured my attention over the last few years, is elevation-independent warming. This is the overview of my presentation this evening. Elevation-independent warming is a phenomenon that has emerged recently in the literature on climate change. It is a concept that portrays high altitude areas as more sensitive to climate change, especially increase in temperature compared to lower elevation areas. In other words, we are saying that high altitude areas are much more sensitive to climate change compared to lower elevation areas. This is the study area. What is shaded there are the Drakensberg Mountains. What we see at the Drakensberg Mountains is not just one mountain. It is a chain of several mountains, including the Malanga, the Engangala, the Northern, the Southern, uh, the Maluti, and Eastern Cape. Uh, Dragon's Big Mountains. In these mountains, you see natural landscapes. You also find a lot of activities that are important for rural livelihoods, including plantation agriculture, cultivation of different forms. You also find fisheries as well as tourism among its other land uses, all important for rural livelihoods. And therefore, if the climate is changing and elevation-dependent warming is taking place, we see a threat to social ecological systems in many different ways. In other words, it is going to pose a threat not only to industry, but also to tourism, to agriculture, to aquaculture, to food security, employment, poverty, and overall rural livelihoods. It will also pose a threat um, to regional trade due to the fact that it will have an effect on availability of local commodities. On the biodiversity side, it is also going to cause a lot of conservation uh, damage due to the fact that biological diversity will be lost. We are talking about 
several conditions that prevail in, in the region. First of all, uh, this is where we find the Malut Dragonsbeck Transfrontier Conservation Area, the Okashamba Dragonsbeck Park, which is a world um, heritage site uh, declared as such by UNESCO in 2000. We find a lot of um, Ramsar, uh, Ramsar sites there as well. We also find national parks. There are altogether 24 nat nature and game reserves in the area. So you will find that if the environment becomes warmer, you will have a huge impact on biological diversity. And for that reason, it is worth pursuing, it is worth understanding uh, how this particular uh, phenomenon will affect the environment. One important aspect of it is species richness. There is the part of the mountains we refer to as the Dragonsberg Alpine Center. There you find thousands of species. For example, there are 2,520 recorded species of angiosperms. You also have hundreds of species of endemic um, uh, angiosperms and some which are near endemic. That is to say, if they are extinct, they can never be found anywhere else in the world. Also, we have hundreds of invertebrates. Let me say 40% of all non-marine birds that are found in South Africa are found in the Drakensberg Mountains. Apparently, many of them are endangered. Uh, many of them are rare as well. The example the examples that I can cite here is Cape, the Cape Voucher, the Water Crane, a Lesser Kester, among other species. It will also pose a huge threat to water supply in the region. This is where we find the Lesotho Highlands project, which supplies water to this region. South Africa generally is regarded as a thirsty country. And we don't have enough water in this part of the country, except for water that is harnessed through the uh, Lesotho Water High Highlands project, project. And 25% of the water that uh, is utilized by the Hauteng region, emanates from this region. 70% uh, of the water supply uh, required in Bluefontein comes from this region as well. Now, when we have got problems associated with elevation dependent warming, we are likely to run into a situation where we'll have aquatic and terrestrial habitats affected. And this might also worsen a number of other conditions that are not desirable in mountain environments, including overgrazing, soil erosion, uh, silt siltation, and the spread of invasive species. And in the final analysis, we might also end up having hydropolitical problems due to the fact that there will be conflict over water when water runs out of uh, short supply. And this will be a threat to uh, social peace. Uh, before I get to my research question, I just want to uh, take you through a short tour of where the research that I'm talking about, on which this lecture is based, 
was conducted. And I want to make reference to nine points here. The first set of points fall on this transit. Emelo, Harry Smith, point four, and Marcel. And the second set are on this transit, which I am calling transit two. It's point one, point two, and Harry Smith. And then the last is set which I'm referring to for the purposes of, for the purpose of this lecture is um, this set of points, point three, four, five, and six. Now these points are located different elevations. This is where elevation uh, dependent homing was tested. The other two transits uh, transits uh, which were used as a control in the assessment. Now, these points on transit one and also on transit two are on the same level of altitude. Their elevations are the same. They're all about 1,600 meters above sea level. But the points on transit three fall on different elevation locations. Now, the source of the data that I used was gleaned from, from the internet. And the reason for this was that there is scarcity of climate data for the mountain regions. And this is for obvious reasons. Mountains are not readily acceptable. Uh, regions, and there are very few weather stations in some locations, as shown on this map. Now, uh, many of the locations that I've mentioned, this point that I was referring to, fall away from um, these weather stations in terms of distance. And accordingly, it was necessary to uh, use uh, gridded data from the internet. Let me also mention that this region is where we have um, our watershed, the main watershed. You will see here in this uh, image, uh, rivers flowing northwards to the east, to the southwest, in all directions. This is where the Seku Orange River Basin starts from, and it cascades all the way to Namibia in the west, uh, through South Africa. Now, to give you an indication of the variability of the terrain in the area. Let me show the profile here of the study area. Uh, transit one, for all those points that are uh, ranging around 1,600 meters above sea level, starting from Melo through Harry Smith, then point four, and finally, Maseru. Uh, you can see that altitude generally increases uh, southward and then starts to decrease again um, in places close to Maseru and beyond. If you look at the second transit now, you see that these points. are located again on the same level in terms of elevation, starting from point one there, Harry Smith, and point two, they're all about 1,600 meters above sea level. 
But over here, this is where you, our uh, escarpment starts from. Similarly, if you look at transit three here, you'll notice again that um, elevation increases from the east, uh, from the west eastward up until you reach the escarpment and thereafter it starts decreasing. Point number six is the lowermost point in terms of elevation. The highest point is point number five here, which is about 1, uh, 3,000 3, meters above sea level. Point number four is around 1,600 meters above sea level. And the last point, point number three, is approximately 1,480 meters above sea level. Now, what does all this mean? It means we are here to test to see if elevation dependent warming exists in the mountains. And the research question accompanying that quest was is there evidence of elevation dependent warming in the Drakensberg Mountains? And if so, what are the implications for the existing for the existence uh, of um, environmental resources and social ecological systems in the region? And therefore, the objective of the research was to determine if elevation-dependent warming is taking place in the drug and mountain regions, and then to assess the implications for the environment and social ecological systems in the region. Now, the sources of the data, like I have said already, the data was obtained from internet sources, the Climate Research Unit time series 4.05, uh, which is accessible via Climate Explorer. Uh, the other source of data was well, this website here. You know, the data for the standardized Precipitation and Vapor Transpiration Index. Now, this type of data is important in the sense that you can determine how the environment is changing through time by analyzing uh, the values. There is a way of classifying, which I shall turn to in a moment. Locational and elevation data was obtained through Google Earth Pro. Um, now let us look at how I had to classify the data in order to determine the nature of changes in the environment. Under normal circumstances, standardized precipitation and vapor transpiration rates um, are influenced by, by temperature. And conditions are considered as normal if the indices range between minus 0 0.99 to 0 0.99. Anything that is above that is regarded as, as wet. So we have moderately wet, very wet, and extremely wet conditions. And below that, we have got dry conditions. Uh, this is where we have um, moderate droughts, severe droughts, and extremely severe droughts, depending on the uh, ranges of uh, the SPIE, SPEIV values. Now let us go to the results.
These are the results. Uh, time series analysis was conducted for the temperature data and also for the SPEI values. And what is uh, noticeable here, what is noticeable here is that temperature has been increasing since 1980, but the increase has not been statistically significant along transect one or for point that allocated along transect one. But what is also noticeable here, which is important, is that since 2000, in most of the years, there has been below average SPEI values. In other words, it indicates that as the temperature was increasing, the conditions in the environment were becoming drier and drier. Of course, there are certain years in which um, an exception was recorded, 2009, 2010, and 11 were fairly wet years, especially in, on Emelo, at Emelo, Harry Smith, and Point Four, as well as Maseru. When it comes to transit two now, more or less the same trend in terms of temperature has been recorded, except that for one of the points, which is point two, temperature increase has been statistically significant. Similarly, on transit three, there has been an increase in temperature all the way starting from 1980, but it is only statistically significant at uh, 0.6 years, which is on the other side of the escarpment. For the rest of the point, it is not statistically significant. However, it is also the same thing with other two transit that since around 2000, there has been an increase in the number of years that recorded below average um, SPEI values. So, Again, it is the same story that uh, the temperature in the environment has been increasing and um, it has been coupled with um, increasing uh, dry condition, the prevalence of dry condition or drought. The summary of the results now Emelo is the one that recorded the highest increase in temperature. Uh, the difference between the temperature in 1908 and uh, 2018 is 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. And this is followed uh, by Harry Smith, which is the next point along the first transit. And the lower values were recorded at Point Four and Maseru. What this indicates is that uh, the places that are closest to the equator are the ones that have recorded the highest temperature increase compared to those that are furthest from the equator. Uh, transit two, where the points are located at 1,600 meters above sea level, have recorded very similar temperature increases, hovering between 1.1 and 1.2. In other words,
ציינת את הדעת שהבינה קודם, בין So has it been good to know? Is it good to tango? Ah, yeah. Well, to tango is a good one. So I'm starting. All right. Uh, thank you. It is one of those things that happen all the time when one is in the lecture room. So, uh, we are used to it now. So what I was saying earlier is that definitely there has been a temperature increase uh, at all locations along the three transits. But what is also evident is that, contrary to what is expected of elevation-dependent warming, that uh, there is amplification of temperature increase with, with uh, altitude. It is the lowermost point that has recorded the highest increase. On average here, we see that the temperature has increased by between 0.2 and 0.5 degrees Celsius per decade in, in the study area. 
And in a way, this is worrisome. It is worrisome in the sense that even such a small uh, change in temperature can have devastating effect on the environment. The most recent years are the ones that have recorded the lowest SPI values, meaning also that conditions in the environment in the later part of the time series have been characterized uh, by higher frequency of uh, dry conditions. So therefore here, if we were to conclude would say that there is no evidence of elevation dependent warming based on this analysis. However, even though there is a limited occurrence of statistically significant changes in temperature, warming is still evident in the Drakenberg Mountains. And this can still affect the social ecological systems and with devastating impacts on other aspects of the environment. Like I said earlier, even a small increase in average temperature can lead to disastrous effects on ecosystems and supply of ecosystems, goods and services. And this is uh, the reason why we ought to get worried. And we want to ask ourselves the question, is it possible to attain sustainability in mountain environments? To answer this question, I would say, first of all, we need to understand how our environment is structured. The environment consists of what we refer to as the ecological part, that is the biophysical condition that prevail there, and then the social component and the economic component. And each one of them is characterized by as certain forms of capital. The ecological part of the environment is characterized by nat the natural resources, the ones that we utilize and depend on for livelihood, and the social environment consists of uh, the human and social uh, capital. The human capital referring to the skills and the knowledge that we em employ in harvesting the resources. And then the social part, uh, the social capital, uh, denoting, uh, obviously, um, uh, the, the Ubuntu, the Ubuntu, which the things that ref relate to how uh, we associate with one another, uh, altruism, for example. And then the third one, third pillar, consists of uh, the physical and the financial aspects or part of the environment. The physical part of the environment, the physical resources, that we have, that is the infrastructure and financial resources, the liquid capital. But all in all, we are talking about the ecological resources, human related resources, and, and financial resources. Now, how do we manage this in the light of the fact that our environment is um, becoming warmer and drier? Now, to answer this, I would like us to relate very briefly uh, to these three forms of capital. And I want to uh, relate to uh, the first pillar and its characteristics. The natural environment is under threat um, and according to the Neomalthusians, it is because the environment has the carrying capacity. 
and that carrying capacity should not be exceeded and uncontrolled growth of population, whether it is human or animal population, can actually offset the state of the environment because it will lead to a resource degradation and depletion. Uh, there is a lot that has been um, done within this area uh, by ecologists and biologists and other players. For example, work done by the American ecologist, Jared uh, Hardin, and also Paul Ralph Eric, an American biologist. Now, this idea of carrying capacity is a widely uh, held view globally. And it is a view that has been uh, referred to in many contexts internationally. For example, um, in its book entitled Caring for the Earth, a Strategy for Sustainable Living, in which, uh, which was published in 1991, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature adopted the carrying capacity as one of its nine principles. And likewise, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are hit on the same principle. Goal number 12, for example, calls for responsible consumption and production. But the question is, how do we maintain human and animal populations in mountain environments within the carrying capacity of the environment where resources are becoming less and less or are likely to become less and less as a result of climate change or the warming that is taking place? In other words, the resource base is shrinking. Now, this ladies and gentlemen, makes a strong case for land reform as a tool for relieving the pressure that we have in the environment. Uh, the current pressures partly owe their origin uh, to the promulgation of uh, the Group Areas Act in 1950, which was swiftly passed and brutally enforced and within a short time after the National Party had risen to power, we saw the South African landscape changing. Uh, boundary stands or homelands were set up, and Kwakwa is one of those homelands. It was established in 1974 for the Sotho-speaking people who were forcibly removed from white towns and farms where they had previously worked, according to Slater 2002. And to use Slater's own words, Bagua became exceptionally overcrowded, weighing on in the same issue, uh, Sharp 1994 uh, reported that by 1989, population densities in Bagua had already reached 933 people per square kilometer. And I want to believe that the figure is not as low as that anymore, because uh, this was 20 years or more ago. Now, the question here um, is, why has it taken so long for the post-1994 uh, democratically uh, elected government to address the land question. Now, in my own view, the answer to this question lies in power dynamics. And let me explain that uh, power is often confused with authority. Authority 
is the right to make decisions, but power is the ability or capacity or potential to influence decisions. The two are not one and the same, even though they are often used interchangeably. Now, I want to go back to the question that I've just posed. Why has it taken so long for the post-1994 democratically elected government to address the land question? I wish to invoke the Foucauldian uh, discourse. Now, this takes us to the second pillar. Um, according to this discourse, power and knowledge as well as science are interlinked. This school of thought owes its origin from a French philosopher, Michael Foucault, who argued that power is constituted through accepted forms of knowledge, uh, scientific understanding, and truth. Now, if that is the case, the question that we ought to answer is, whose knowledge or whose scientific truth or uh, understanding qualifies to be acceptable? Now, who appropriates meaning to knowledge or to scientific understanding or truth? And who decides on the agenda for the mountains? Now, these are difficult questions to answer. And you cannot answer them without making reference to South Africa's police landscape. And I want to say that the police landscape in South Africa as fissures. On the one hand, we have got stakeholders whom we can call indigenous communities who practice citizen science and who depend on indigenous knowledge systems and tacit forms of knowledge that are often regarded as esoteric or metaphysical in mainstream science. They occupy limited space on the police landscape. On the other hand, we have got another group of stakeholders. These are the technocrats or the outsiders or the bureaucrats. And more often than not, they are known as consultants they are also known by other terms, environmental assessment practitioner, and so on and so forth. Now, putting things together, I would say that these are the ones who hold legitimate knowledge, uh, legitimate and accepted scientific understanding and truth they dominate the policy landscape. Now, here comes another question. Is this knowledge, scientific understanding or truth provide a solution to challenges facing South African mountain environments? I am persuaded not to answer in the affirmative to illustrate my doubts, I refer to two recently uh, adopted policies, namely the National Climate Change Response Policy, which was coined in 2000, and the National Climate Change Adaptation Strategy, uh, which was um, adopted in 2017. Now, if you look at these two documents, you find that mountains are not given any prominence. In the National Climate Change Adaptation Strategy, for example, 
you find that mountain environments are mentioned only once and in passing for that matter. In that strategy, you find a number of programs. And there is a program for virtually every aspect of the environment except the mountain. There is a program for each one of the following, for example, working for the forest, working for the ecosystems, working for the coast, working for the land, working for water, working on fire, working on waste. There is also a program on man and biosphere reserves, which makes a cursory reference to uh, small enclaves of mountain environments, including uh, the water bag in Limpopo, the garden route in the Western Cape, and Macalisbeck in Haucheng and Northwest. In other words, there is a program for virtually everything except for the mountains. Now, to explain this omission, I would like us to turn to the third pillar. And in so doing, I'm borrowing uh, from the Konokopian view to explain the tr trivialization of mountain environments. Konokopian is a term derived from Konokopia, referring to Horn of Plenty, which symbolizes unlimited abundance. In other words, the Konokopians believe that resources in the environment are inexhaustible. Now, among us, the leading Concopians, whose work I'm going to make reference to, include William Godwin, an English philosopher, Esther Bosraff, a Danish economist, and Simon Julian, an American philosopher. William Godwin, Godwin argues, for example, that there is no evil under which the human species cannot labor that man is not competent to cure. In other words, humanity can solve all its problems. Um, weighing in on a similar matter, or on a similar note, Esther Bozarab argued that population pressure is the mother of invention. In other words, it doesn't matter we have got those pressures in the environment, uh, humanity will find solutions. Uh, for those pressures. Similarly, Julian Simon said that human beings are our greatest uh, resource and any attempt to curb our numbers misguidedly cheat us out of geniuses who could otherwise create solutions uh, to resource shortages. In other words, when we look at all this, we see that the Concopians are arguing for the laissez faire or neoliberal approach where market forces should be left to decide the fate of mountains. To me, this sounds like inaction, which obviously will lead to fatalism. History has taught us about the dangers of adopting such approaches. Just to give you an example, before the 1990s, there was a national industrialization program in South Africa. It was referred to as the Regional Industrial Development Program. And in that particular program, um, subsidies were channeled towards industries, particularly those that were located in homelands or close to the homelands, which were referred to as border industries. Come in the 1990s, South Africa adopted or embraced an economic structural adjustment program under the instigation of the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, and subsidies fell away. And what happened then is that many industries in the homelands closed, 
and that was due to lack of viability. And following those closures, in the case of Krakwa, uh, the homeland became de-industrialized with uh, losses of unemployment and an increased dependence on, informal, on the informal sector and on social welfare for livelihood. And the younger people emigrated elsewhere to look for uh, opportunities. And those who remained behind had no choice but to depend on livelihood strategies that directly impact on environmental resources, including livestock holding, which is one of the problems that we are facing in the mountains today. Therefore, my question is, if the laissez fair or the neoliberal approach has not worked in the past, why should it work now? As I express this pessimism, I want to say that the question that you might have now is about how then we can answer the quest for sustainability in mountain environments in the light of threats posed by climate change. In my own opinion, I want to believe that it is still possible not everything has been lost as yet. If we adopt what I will coin the pinzas model, the pinzas is that device that has got two jaws. But if you remove one of the jaws, it doesn't work. Now, in my own view, one of the jaws are instruments of governance. And this can be employed all the way from the local level to the international level. Local level is important in the sense that this is where people are in direct in contact with environmental resources and this is where degradation is taking place. And at the same time, this is where resources should be managed. When you look now at the international stage, you find that it is not possible to manage mountain environment or resources where without uh, uh, engaging other countries. Let us look at the Seku Orange River Basin, for example. Like I said earlier, it spans across Lesotho, South Africa, and Namibia. It means that there has to be collective effort if uh, the resources in the basin have to be managed in a sustainable manner. Uh, on the other hand, the other side of um, the Pinzas model comprises uh, research and development in, uh, instruments. This is where institutions of higher learning come in. And these two uh, aspects ought to complement each other for the Pinzas model to work. There has to be a shift, therefore, from the current dependence on neoliberal comprehensive planning models to more adaptive planning models. Um, there ought to be a shift also towards pluralism and inclusive planning approaches. Normally, adopted along and along multidisciplinary perspectives. Now this also entails a shift towards research-based solutions so that we look at solutions that are based on evidence. In this case, therefore, we are referring to research-based solutions that are anchored on redefined knowledge, scientific understanding, and truth. We should be guided by the principle of subsidiarity, 
in which tires of government work hand in glove with local agents in planning, in policy development and formulation, and in implementation of environmental projects and programs. In that context, the university's role is to provide guidance uh, on the process of redefining knowledge, uh, scientific understanding and truth in order to promote sound mountain development interventions and programs. Now, as I head towards the end of my presentation, I just want to say that it is not possible to have uh, solutions that are based on technocratic approaches alone. It is not possible to do that. Therefore, this quest for the kind of truth that can be defined in terms that can be understood readily by local communities who are in touch and in conduct with the realities that uh, are manifested by the environment. I will not be able to answer all your questions. Let me conclude by saying that, by telling you a sh very short story of a professor who was lecturing and he had brilliant students in his class. And one of the students raised a question and the professor could not answer the question. The professor simply said, look, this is the question that I wanted to ask you. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, this is your homework. <laughs> and consequently, I will expect you to report in the next lecture. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, uh, by the same token, I'm not going to be able to answer some of your questions, <laughs> but I want to believe uh, you have come across the relevant answers in our discussion during the next lecture. Thank you. <laughs>
So I will invite Dimpo Musia to come and present the gift. Prof Mukwada, please, if you can rise up. It's been a long time that we have this kind of thing, so he deserves a gift. Please rise. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> All right, I just want to thank everybody for coming from the chairman of Kansu, the vice chancellor and director who is joining us virtually, the vice rector of research and internationalization with our husband here. Thank you for driving all the way from Bloomfontein the Vice Rector Academic, Dr. Van Staden, who's joining us virtually, the Registrar, who is also joining us virtually, the Campus Principal, thank you for coming, the Campus uh, Vice Principal Academic and Research, Professor Situli, thank you for coming, the Vice Campus Principal Support Services, Mr. Manchu, thank you for coming, the Executive Director, Student Affairs, thank you for coming. My own Dean, who is also joining us virtually, thank you. And I'm told that some of our colleagues, some of my colleagues and uh, some of the head of department are also joining virtually. Thank you so much for joining us. I also want to thank the Assistant Deans, the Assistant Dean of Economic and Management Science, the Assistant Dean of Education, the Assistant Dean of Humanities in Absentia, and our own Assistant Dean on the Kwakwa Campus for Natural and Agricultural Sciences. I also want to thank the Senior Director of Institutional Advancement, and I would also like to thank my friend, the head of the afro Mountain Research Unit. Specifically, I want to thank you, Prof Mukwada, it's been a great pleasure working with you. And uh, I remember when I first came and joined the department, he welcomed me with his warm heart. And uh, when I left for Bloomfontein, nearly any time when I had a call with him that he would not ask about my family. I appreciate that. We thank you for your researches and educations, the lead leadership that you have provided to our department as a whole over the years and also to the faculty. I sent greetings from all other colleagues to you. I wish you well in your future endeavors. I also want to thank your family for being there for you. Your wife, I've met her once. Your daughter, she was here. And your son, I've also met once. And your nephew. I also want to appreciate all external stakeholders of the University of the Free State the Student Representative Council, the staff, and I want to specifically appreciate the staff of the Department of Geography. Can I see your hands? Department of Geography staff, thank you so much for being there for, for Prof Mukwada, and thank you for planning this great event. I also want to thank the students of Prof Mukwada. If you are a student now, of Prof Mukada, can I see your hands up as well? You could see them. Let's give them a round of applause too. I think that indeed they have shaped the life of Prof Mukwada in achieving this great height. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this event. But before we go, I would like to invite Prof Mukwada to please stand. 
and uh, go to the banner there and uh, probably congratulate all the people who have come to, to this um, inaugural lecture. So please, if you can go while all other people remain uh, seated, please, Prof Mukwada. Please, you can stand at the, at the board there. So if you want to take pictures with him, that's the latest full professor that we have in the, in the university and most importantly on the Kwakwa campus. Let's give him a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to not stand on your way for refreshments, teas, and a little bit of refreshment is there for you. Thank you, and God bless you. I will leave, I will leave the two of you. <laughs>